you're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are back for our last week discussing John Dixon Cars, The Crooked Hinge, all the way to the end with our good friend Brad Friedman of Our Sweet Mystery. Brad, we're sorry to have to send you off like this to bid you farewell <laughs> to, to this catastrophic ending. It's the end of a journey. I, I, I'm hoping this will become an annual thing. You'll find some old mystery that you'll want me to come back and tend to fool you with until you completely flummox me by knowing every <laughs> element of oh the solution. I, I, I want to say... So much of what happens in this is tying together the motive in this last stretch of chapters, which I thought was a good bit of fun. Mm. But then we get to the the breakdown scene. And as we were going through the explanation, I was like, why is this Brad's favorite novel? This is the bad joke answer for the solution to this crime. (laughs) But then, of course, it turns out that it was to fake out the last piece of information that Dr. Fell needed. This is interesting Mm. that you say that because, you know, whenever this novel comes up, in my little blogosphere, a lot of people say that they prefer the fake ending. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the fun. reason I think of it as a bad joke answer, Herds, is probably because it's the bad joke answer that you gave for our very first murder mystery on the show, the impossible fishing line. <laughs> Look, I have a soft spot for fishing <laughs> lines. Ronald and Knox? Was that... Was that was three, three taps, taps yeah. yeah. That was my first bad theory. It was that the fisherman hooked him through the window with with the the fishing hook, which is terrible. I think my favorite detail of of Fell's like fake theory is, but what about the blood splatter from this ridiculous triple knived gypsy ball that would spin through the air? Well, obviously all the blood was washed off in the water. But then why isn't there blood in the water? Oh, well, you know, it's 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 water. It cleanses everything. That's like a theme <laughs> in the story. I mean, also both theories rely on some near superhuman talent from the culprit, so it doesn't get away from that either way. Mm. Well, that's true. I mean, and how lucky that Molly lived near some gypsies and Patrick <laughs> on the Titanic. I mean, if not for that, you wouldn't have a book. It's true. Yeah, I, th- well, I think it's, it is it is really interesting, though, talking about the whole gypsy angle, the side story we go on to explain Victoria Daly's death. The Satanism? What, what was happening there? That was insane. <laughs> this simultaneously romantic and mysterious scene between Brian and Madeline where they're sat in this house walking through all of the steps of how the murder happened was kind of hilarious. Also, Satanism. What happens if someone came into the house and put the dress over the top of Victoria? It's like, it's these two pieces that cannot possibly yeah. fit together, but it's all the better for it. You were uncomfortable mm. with the, I love you, I love you, I love you. Another theory <laughs> is that I was back and forth, theorizing <laughs> and lovemaking. Well, they yeah. were, I, I consider that eco- economy. And I think we all <laughs> think John Dixon Carr for being economical rather than having a long drawn out love scene, which according to, of course, the rules we're not supposed to even have and also theorizing. And he managed to do both at the same time, which I thought was wonderful. We, well, not only that, but we managed to wrap the scene up with a murder attempt. Molly takes a, a, a pot shot at them while they're, you know, discussing their theories. Like we wrap every little thing, the horror elements of the of the automaton, and like everything is kind of wrapped together in this one scene. It's like it's like the overture scene in a musical play. It's sure, just sure. fantastic. Just it's everything ridiculous. happens at once. What I like about that scene is up until that scene, Brian is a nothing. I mean, <laughs> most of these young men are fairly innocuous in the books. They sort of exist there to overhear everything. And that's all Brian does. He invites people to stay. And then he listens to them and goes, what? (laughs) But that's all. In this scene, he's a hero. He comes up with a solution basically to Victoria's crime. So, I mean, Mm. it justifies his being in the book. Yeah. I mean, I'm impressed how many detectives actually contribute something of value in the book as well. Brian does, Elliot does, Fell does, Burroughs has his coroner's inquest gambit, which was fantastic. Um, this is the second book that we've had a coroner's inquest in that was like a big part of the plot. Yeah. It's, it's weird that they happen two books in a row, but anyway. <laughs> Come on, you, you're telling me I don't plan these things out, Herds? You knew there was a coroner's inquest in this book that Brad pitched? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how that works. Puzzle that one. 
Sorry. Um, the other thing is, if you read a lot of these books, there's the false solution followed by the real solution. Mm. And let me tell you, the first time I got a kind of little lump in my throat with you guys was at our first meeting when um, Flex said something about, well, you know, sometimes people provide false alibis for other people. I thought, oh, well, is he going to see this? Mm. <laughs> is he going to find this? I was close. It yeah. was definitely the case that like this impossible room was sealed by alibi rather than locks. And yes. I thought... It was it was great fun to like you know rest your hand on Noel's shoulder and then cut away to the letter from the culprit. It was this beautiful one two punch to kind of seal where the room was sealed. Sure, and I think that if I was going to start nitpicking about some of the fairness, is that I didn't really know how much Knowles hated John Farnley. I was wondering about that. Knowles is kind of a bizarre character. I like how much of his previous actions are highlighted and justified, which is great because as you were talking about the women in, in John Dixon Carr's novels, they're either, you know, they look very pretty and they're actually evil or they look evil and actually good. Well, the same is kind of being done with Knowles here, whether he seems like I'm just an old man servant and I can see very well, don't you know? But he actually is like maybe the worst character in there. Yeah. I mean, as soon as soon as he says he has perfect eyesight, he's booked himself in as a, as a you know an accomplice, mm, even exactly. if by a mission. Well, maybe so, but um, it, it isn't apparent at all until he says so that he had a a reason for providing Patrick Gore, who was essentially a stranger, with with the alibi. It is kind of interesting, actually, that like, yeah, well, that was one of the things I suspected would be uh, th- th- that would go afoul with Molly's character would be that she'd be like, oh, goodness, the the young boy that I loved when I was seven, I'll do anything to take him back. But it was actually Knowles. It was Knowles that kind of took that angle a little Knowles bit, was which the was true strange. romantic character. Yeah, yeah it's great. <laughs> That's the huge twist that I remember from this book from before. Um, but you talked about how what's going on here with all these people and the witchcraft and all that. That was kind of a thing, you know, in the 30s. People yeah. bored in villages and they would kind of practice dark arts to kind of relieve their boredom. And that was something that was written about in a lot of books. There's yeah. a very famous, and I, I can't recommend it highly enough, John Dixon Carr earlier novel, The Burning Court, which um, really takes you all the way to the end about the concept of supernatural phenomena. I mean, because there's kind of, I think, a rule there will be no supernatural phenomena in a book. Yeah. I was kind of hoping that this novel would, would go that far, that we'd like see a witch fly by the window on, on fishing line, of course. I mean, we, uh, we'd have to justify that uh, one. Does the automaton not count to you, Herds? Well, I mean, when do we actually see the automaton like do anything? We see it get kicked down the it stairs. Does, it does the horror monster trope where it keeps showing up with no explanation for how it got there. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, that's, 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 it's, I mean, it, is, it is fantastic. It's fun. Automaton does provide one great clue. And these are clues I didn't notice when I first read it. But the, the mm. clue is that when they're all standing around talking about the automaton and someone says to Dr. Phil, can you even figure out how it works? And, and Patrick Gore said, I'll give anybody a bunch of even money. A child. And he mm. says, well, why don't we find out what the presenter was wearing? And Patrick Gore has a very strong reaction to that because he understands the power of, you know, a little dwarfish person going under robes or a big dress mm. to get to the automaton and then slipping into that cupboard, that table, um, yeah. and, and manipulating it from there. I suppose that was something I wanted to ask about. There's a bunch of citations in here, Brad, for like oh, examples of the historiography of some of these tricks and planks, um, and including one at the end of the book, looking at a practical textbook for magistrates, police officers, and lawyers adapted from the German system of criminology. Are these real books? Do you know anything about this? 1934. Um, I don't know. Maybe they didn't buy it at the Sydney Library. I can't tell you. I'm sure it's a real book. You know, there's a sort of a rule about, um, what do you call them? Um, Footnotes? Footnotes. Sorry. <laughs> I just had a, mo- a COVID moment myself. <laughs> That's right. Something about footnotes, that there's got to be a certain honesty Because it's them. interesting. I was speaking with uh, Harini Nagendra about her novel, The uh, Bangalore Detectives Club, and she was saying that there was so much in her book that she had to strip out because her editors were like, we're going to have to put footnotes in mm-hmm. uh, if if we keep all of this stuff in. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's some historical precedent here. Why not? 
Why not have some footnotes in here explaining the ridiculous criminal sciences? SS Van Dyne had them on every let's, fourth l- page. Let's not use SS Van Dyne. Ah, uh, yes, Van Dyne. <laughs> the pinnacle, the pinnacle of writing uh, quality. All right, all right. <laughs> Known more for his coke habits than anything else. Anyway, <laughs> now we love Van Dyne on the show. Too many rules, though. Too many rules. I suppose, speaking of the rules, we should probably wrap this part of the discussion here and we can- uh, I'll blast we you. Can, what, you got something, uh, Herds? So let's- No, it's on. fine. Let's okay. continue. No, we got to get to the next part of the show. Let's go. We can uh, come back after we've had a short break and discuss all the other details of the mystery that we haven't quite gotten to. We are discussing John Dixon Carr's The Crooked Hinge with Brad Freeman from Our Sweet Mystery all the way to the end. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER. We'll be back with more in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with you. I'm joined today by Aoife Clifford, author of When We Fall. You might have heard me talk about this book a few months ago on ABC Radio National's The Bookshelf with Dr. Kate Evans and Cassie McCullough. Coming up at the Sydney Writers' Festival, there is a panel called Small Town Big Secrets with Gary Disher, Haley Scrivener, Dr. Kate Evans, and Aoife Clifford. And ahead of that, I wanted to bring you this discussion that I had with Aoife a short while ago, talking about the book all the way in depth. The spoilers are going up on the podcast exclusively later this week, so you have no worries for this chat, but I am so excited to finally bring this to you after so long with it sitting in the wings. Aoife, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. I'm delighted to be part of it. I should say before we begin, I was mentioning in the introduction that, uh, you know, I discussed this on Radio National with Cassie McCullough, Dr. Kate Evans, and we were talking a bit before we began about review regret and that feeling where once you've done an interview with an author, you go, oh, there are all these other things I should have asked. So this is a fantastic opportunity for me because I already have review regret from the ABC The Bookshelf episode. So now I get to be here and this is kind of a companion piece interview. Oh, brilliant. I love companion um, novels. So uh, this is the first time I've done a companion interview. So I'm for it. Awesome. Well, yeah. So When We Fall is set in the small coastal town of Merritt, a down-on-her-luck city barrister. Alex is in her childhood home to try and get her dementia-addled mother, Denny, into an assisted living home, sell the family house to pay for it. And as local property prices rise with the growing encroachment of urbanity, there's a, there's a clock ticking. Out for a walk on Beacon Beach, Denny finds a severed leg and the local cops obstinately refuse to see it as more than an ocean-faring accident. And I guess the thing that I wanted to get into first is... What pushed you into this just haunting, coastal, lighthouse, abandoned community genre that seems to be popping up? Well, I mean, big question. Lighthouses were an important part of it. I think because I wrote this book in lockdown, the way I usually start my books is I kind of shove a couple of ideas together and I kind of go from there and they can be quite very different ideas. But definitely while I was in lockdown, kind of wild places were attracting me more and more as I got really sick of my own four walls. So I've always loved lighthouses. I've always wanted to do something with a lighthouse. And of course, if you've got a lighthouse, then you need to be by the coast. So I think the lighthouses are kind of like wild architecture for me. They're so alien to their landscape and so part of their landscape at the same time. Then you've got, you know, the obvious metaphor of shining lights in darkness and all that sort of stuff that I couldn't resist it. But also that lovely idea about lighthouses themselves, when you go into them, are so small and tiny and windy. And yet, they look out on a landscape so large and enormous. So there were so many ideas that I wanted to play with. And so that was it. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of lighthouses in fiction. I read a really wonderful book that I kept coming back to that was about Tasmanian lighthouses as well. And perhaps also lighthouses aren't that uncommon if you're part of the Victorian, in Victoria. So they're part of our landscape. And so they're dotted all along uh, coastline, which is, you know, known as the shipwreck coast for a very good reason. So historically around here, lighthouses are pretty important. 
as well as in Tasmania. And so I, I was really keen to add, add to that genre. Yeah, no, it, it's great fun. I mean, we've featured a small subsection of them on the show in our own time. And I just love that idea that they represent so many like conflicts in the things that we see in the world. You know, it's like so isolated and closed off, but can see so much as you say, you know, it, it can so easily contain secrets, but also shine light in places. It's so many opposites that work so nicely together. And I I thought that Opposites was also something that you did really well in When We Fall, you know, the opposites of the big city barracks, the coming back to the small town, the opposites of the like family values of this small town against single mothers and that generational problem going there. Why is it you think that Opposites are so effective at exposing each other in fiction and what makes them such a fun device to play with? Well, that's a great question. I think it's because they rub up against each other and can spark such different ideas. And often when I get an idea for a book, I do like looking at that idea from all different angles. So just to give one example for when we fall, I mean, one of the things I was really interested in was parent-child relationships, probably um, very uh, focused on mother-child relationships in particular, but it broadens out into parents. And I really tried to include So many different ways of looking at that, whether it was, you know, adopted children or lost children or lost parents or absent parents or and then the main character herself doesn't have any children at all and doesn't it doesn't seem that doesn't bother her in the slightest. So I often like to do that kind of 360 idea of focus on an idea and um, play with all the different angles. So, of course, that then runs into the exact contrast of it because I don't want to feel like you give one answer and that's kind of the answer to whatever the concept is or that's my opinion on the concept. I often try and challenge myself to look at it from another angle as well. Yeah, I thought that was something that was fascinating about the structure of the novel as well, because one, not necessarily opposite, but things that have often kind of jockeyed for space in the public attention have been genre fiction and literary fiction. And You've, you've crammed yourself into the, the literary crime novel here, which is uh, a modern contradiction that the world is growing to love more and more with every iteration. And I thought something that was so clear of how effectively you did it, as I mentioned over on Radio National, was that uh, Denny's plight as a, being recently did, uh, diagnosed with dementia meant that there was such a strong emotional co- core to the novel, but was also pushing the crime forwards. I almost had to laugh seeing... Uh, Mark Brandy on the cover because that's like kind of his staple as well and I, I just thought it was so fascinating seeing how well what is normally the distraction the red herring in the traditional old school crime novels that I like to read pushed to the forefront and helped make uh, the crime stuff so much stronger why do you think it took the world so long to come around to that idea that a narrative can make a puzzle better absolutely look I'm so delighted Um, you said that because I'm all for why can't you have both? Like why (laughs) is it a choice? And um, I'm a greedy reader. I want um, my the books I read to have great characters, great sentences, and also you can still have the puzzle. And um, that puzzle shouldn't be kind of diminished because I think for a long time there was this idea that plot isn't important Um, that plot was somehow lesser than your characterization or lesser than the structure. Yeah. I want to, I want to pick you up on something there. I want to say that because a lot of people would say that Agatha Christie was one of the greatest plotters of all time, but her plots were never a story. Mm. They were a structure more. And I think that it's more that the idea that those are separate concepts is what we've erased. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, like, it's sort of like I grew up, reading Agatha Christie, um, as as probably most uh, people my age, Agatha Christie would be your first dip into adult novels. And so I loved all that. But in year 12, uh, extremely wonderful English teacher taught us, uh, we did Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep and John le Carre's The Spy That Came In From The Cold. And they 
totally changed my world. And so for a long time, there was sort of was like you had to make the choice. Were you a Chandler? I don't really care about plot and I won't answer major plot things. Or were you an Agatha Christie? I have very cleverly put something together and sentences aren't nearly as important for me. And um, and also characterization, not, not as important either. And I'm kind of like, I love people who do both. Like i I, as a writer, I care about all those things and I put effort into all those things, including the puzzle, because the beauty of crime fiction, um, the hand it sort of puts out to the reader and says, not only do I want you to enjoy this read, I want you to actively read it by trying to solve it along with me. And the the joy of trying to solve it before the main character does, awesome. You know, that's that's an awesome driver. I love it as a reader and that's what I attempt to do in my books. Aoife Clifford there talking about her latest novel, When We Fall. There is, of course, more of that discussion going up on the podcast later this week. So make sure you are subscribed up there so you don't miss any of that. Super fun having her on. And thank you to Ultimo Press for linking us up with some copies of that book. More of The Crooked Hinge in just a second. Stick around. This is Death of the Reader on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are here for the autopsy of Brad Freeman and John Dixon Carr's The Crooked oh, Hinge no. all the way to the end. <laughs> Brad from Our Sweet Mystery, his blog where he shares all sorts of uh, wonderful mystery journeys with the blogosphere. Brad? My autopsy, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you were caught off guard by that. That's like a phrase that Flex just throws out sometimes. Your reaction was perfect. We should kick off with how many points you're walking away with here, Brad, because the way to remind you how this game works is that when you're playing for the away team, you get to basically claim points for yourself based on how pettily you feel you can be about any technical error we made. So well, I'm not a petty person. Good. We are, so. <laughs> so I take, I take three and a half points and you take, no. You know what? Um, I, I was thinking about this. Um, I, I was, of course, impressed that you were, you were gunning for Patrick Gore from the start. And there was just nothing that was going to take you away from that. Um, you did suggest last week that Molly was the witch. I would, I would give you, I mean, we're talking four points, right? Four points total. I would give yeah. you guys three of them and I would take one. You'll take one point. That makes sense. One for Victoria Daly. Oh. In service to Victoria Daly. I had no clue. I will share that point with Victoria. Poor Victoria. I expected there will be more character story about yeah. Victoria Daly, but she was really there to shore up the, uh, maybe that's not the right, that's a bit disingenuous of me, but I'm going to use the term, shore up the, the witch angle. Like that's what she was there for. She was there to foreshadow the witchiness with the, the chemicals she was coated with. Um, and the fact that it was seemingly a tramp who was responsible when it couldn't possibly have been a tramp. Yeah. But yeah, I, I had no idea it was going to Victoria Daly. The explanation is basically that she read too many witchy books and went insane, which is a little bizarre, but I'll I'll take it. Yeah. I beg, to, I beg to differ there. Again, I think we're dealing with a group of modern people who are bored. Remember, at the very start, we learned that Brian's very interested in witchcraft too. The, the picture work that fell paints of molly is that she took some kind of pleasure in sort of enticing others over into the dark side one of the things that's very interesting to me and i also didn't remember is that patrick and molly get away with it that is <laughs> so rare they they fly <laughs> off to a foreign land with no extradition and as far as we know they're yeah. off can we can we talk about molly oh my goodness I remember in the first part of the show, I was saying, wow, Molly is being like portrayed as a sort of sympathetic character. I have no idea how she's going to get a happy ending out of this. How is that even going to work? And the straight answer is she's a villain. She doesn't get a happy ending. But Carr has managed to bring it all the way back around to saying she is the villain. Therefore, she can do whatever she wants, including uh, right off into the sunset with the real John Farley, who then haunts Dr. Fell and says, would you like to visit us for tea sometime, sir? Like, I think that's fantastic. I would have liked to have seen more of that, like, explicitly, I suppose. Um, but maybe I just need to read the novel again. Maybe I need to just go over it with that lens and, like, unpack it in my brain. I take your point. I think once Madeline enters, Molly sort of retreats into the background a lot. Way too much. Yeah. She's barely in it. She shows up when they see the automaton, but 
she doesn't appear a lot more. And yeah. uh, Madeline takes center stage. She gets a really great moment when she shoots, when she she takes a pot shot at Madeline. That's a really great, like, yeah. pod language. This is a great girl boss moment. Patrick says she was just trying to scare her. She's not <laughs> an evil person. She's just a person who likes witchcraft like me. Yeah. yeah, I did really love the case with Araman as a set piece because I, yeah. you know, in hindsight as a mystery reader, I really should have thought that was tied in more with the plot. But when it was kind of unveiled to us that that was Patrick Gore, I was like, oh, that's so perfect. And I guess somebody might complain that it's a coincidence. But for me, that moment when... The fake John Farnley walked in on Araman and said, you've got to help me. And Patrick Gore beheld this man who had attacked him and caused him to lose his legs on the Titanic. What a cool moment, you know, at a yeah. fictional moment. But it is a wonderfully dramatic moment where he's like, I have to kill this man. There's almost a sense of justice to it as well, because we established that the fake John Farnley had lost his memory. So, like, yep. he is the victim of a crime he committed himself because he's forgotten he was the culprit. And that's like a fascinating angle to take with the victim of this crime. Well, that's interesting because when Madeline testifies at the inquest, she makes a really good case that. John Farnley wouldn't have killed himself because he was essentially a good person just trying to discover the truth and he didn't care whether he was real or fake. And so we'd make the assumption that he's a good man and a victim and that when he heard mm. the story of the attack, he immediately knew everything was fine because he's too good a person to attack another man like that. And he didn't lie to Madeline. He just forgot. Well, yeah, I, I think that was something that was really cool about it was because so much of this story, I mean, Dr. Fell even says like, I have a fascination for like shirtless old dudes playing cards because of a <laughs> picture that my dad had up on the wall. <laughs> and like everyone has these weird angles uh, of like things that they loved when they were kids that are still part of who they are. But the victim explicitly is the opposite to everyone else. I really oh, enjoy that. I don't know that. why you're casting aspersions on shirtless old dudes, but we'll <laughs> We'll move on from that. Flex. I'm not saying there's anything. That's just what that's just what Dr. Fell says. You that and your he's... obsession with shirtless old men, Flex. Let's, is let's that not what going. Dr. Fell says? Am I misremembering? <laughs> I don't remember. I, I don't I remember it either. I don't know, Flex. This might be a thing you've made up. You look for that. I, I just want to say, I I love that the question at the start of the novel is about who is the real John Farnley, but the question becomes much more about the morality of the two of them. Can I, can I just, can I interject for a moment? It is, Jumping, it is please. fat old Dutchman playing chess and smoking church warden pipes. I'm not, I'm not crazy. You said it was cards, Flex. That's, that's a very different game. Where's the shirtless part? Oh, uh, that, that I definitely interjected. <laughs> <laughs> I embrace your obsessions. That's fine. <laughs> Good. I love it. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Hertz and it's I okay. were talking about something. Yeah, so having an adult conversation. Morality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's having a prestigious clinical philosophical conversation about morality. <laughs> sorry, my, my point was more that he becomes worse, but by the end of the novel, I was kind of rooting for him. Far more attractive <laughs> character than the real John Farnley yeah. because of that freedom that sense of I'm not going to allow myself as the second son of the snuffy <sighs> old guy to be limited by all the things they demand of me. I won't go to school and I won't be a, a lawyer, uh -huh. you know, or, I want to be rich and I want to have sex. Well, I was going to say, I don't want to be limited by the class that I'm in and the responsibilities on me. I want to go join the circus and I'm not going to be limited by the loss of my legs. In fact, I'm going to embrace it. Yes. And it gives me a huge advantage in the that real is world. True. That is in its way, admirable. Even if he yes. uses that in service of some crimes, including murder, he is not, after this devastating event, he is not brought down. He mm -hmm. rises at various heights <laughs> uh -huh. to, to achieve exactly his heart's desire. He gets yeah. the girl of his dreams. He gets everything oh, he wants. That's that, that that has to be why John Dixon Carr chose to let him get away with it in the end, because he figured that you'd be rooting for him because he had overcome this adversity, because he had gotten vengeance on the man who had wronged him, well, because he had managed to find a new life for himself. But you're only understanding that because he gets away and gets to write his confession letter, which is extremely charming. Yes. It is a charming letter. But in Whatever the world, term is. In this world of 30s... Uh, criminal crime fiction where justice was so clearly delineated and always meted out. How rare was it that a person got away with a crime? I suppose at, at the end of all that, I guess the, the thing that's fascinating for me is that like, I don't think this will go down as one of my favorite books of all time. 
but it's certainly one of my favorite Golden Age stories I've ever read. Yeah. So it's a talk I can't about. ask for more. I'm not here to tell you that at the end of the year, I'll be haunting you with your <laughs> final rankings. I don't care where this goes. I'm glad you read it. I think that Carr wrote some brilliant books, uh, and I hope you'll read more of them. Okay, so it has been lovely having you on, Brad, and, and talk about the Crooked Hinge, but I'm in charge next week, uh -oh. and I decided to find the weirdest thing that I could. So next week, we're, we're going to be going to the Synod of Whitby, which is a famous historical event where the Christian churches of Ireland and Rome gathered to decide when Easter should be held, uh -oh. among other things. And we're going to be following uh, a character named uh, Sister Fidelma, who is a firebrand. Irish monkess. We're going to be starting that next week. And that book is, of course, The Absolution of Murder uh, by uh, Peter Tremaine. Uh, we're going to be covering chapters one to seven. Well, I always like a good story about a monkess. I've read it. It's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to covering this one. Good luck, Flex. Thank you. I'm I'm very good excited. Luck, I'm sure he'll have no trouble with the mystery. But <laughs> that's beside the point. It's a great book. We will have links up on the podcast for Brad's blog, Our Sweet Mystery, including some of the wonderful podcast efforts that he was mentioning earlier in the show. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. We'll be back with more on the tour next week on the show. You're listening to SER 107.3, and we'll see you then.